chapter 7. We're going to be reading from verses 36 to the end of the chapter. Starting in verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped him with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman has, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Powerful story. I want to talk today around the topic of grace, God's grace, and our new identity by grace. You know, if you're driving along the road, minding your own business, and all of a sudden you see these blue flashing lights in your rearview mirror, you pull over, and what's the first question the officer asks you? Can I see your identification? Right? But officer, I was going the speed limit. You go into a store, you want to pay with a check, you bring your checkbook out, you start writing the check, and what's the first thing the clerk says to you? Do you have any identification? You're at a social function. You're meeting people who don't know you. One of the first questions that usually asks is, so what do you do? And you answer with, I am, and you say your occupation. I'm a landscaper, I'm a painter, I'm a plumber, I'm a bank executive. And we identify ourselves by what we do. We go to AA meetings, we minister. Whenever anyone stands up and speaks, they say, hey, they say, hi, my name is Jim, I am a alcoholic or a drug, drug, drug addict. People identify themselves by a number, their license. They identify themselves by a picture. They identify themselves by their occupation. They identify themselves by their sickness or their addictions. But in each one of those cases, we're a whole lot more than what the identification was asked for. A whole lot more than a painter. Rick, you're a whole lot more than a landscaper. Tom, you're a whole lot more than a carpenter. And yet, our identification is usually 
<clears throat> shrunken down to something we do, a task that we're good at, or a life that we had lived, or perhaps even a sickness that we're struggling with. How we choose to identify ourselves makes a huge difference in how we live our lives. Our identity, the identity we give ourselves oftentimes defines us. <clears throat> the Bible says that there are two ways that we can be identified scripturally. We're either a sinner, a victim, we're under guilt, we have shame, there's condemnation, we're someone who didn't measure up, we're a sinner, or we're a child of grace, a son or daughter of the king, adopted into God's family, a part of God's kingdom, redeemed by the blood of the lamb, purchased with his precious blood that is more valuable than all the gold and silver in the world. We're, we either self-identify as one or the other. You say, well, I'm not perfect. That's not a category. <laughs> the woman in the story that we read today who anointed Jesus, how was she defined? She comes into Simon's house. She crashed the dinner party because of her great love for Jesus. And she was defined as not a woman who cared for Jesus, but as a sinner. Simon thought to himself, if this man knew who this woman was, she had lived a sinful life. She probably was a prostitute. We don't know. We don't know her name. We don't know what she did. All, I, all we know is that her reputation in town um, was not good. She was a sinner. And by contrast, the Pharisee wasn't. Boy, was he to see. But she was a whole lot more than his definition. And for how much of her life had she defined herself that same way? I'm no good. She was looking to be loved. Perhaps she dealt with rejection early on in life. Perhaps she had a very poor upbringing. Perhaps something went wrong, and it turned her, and she just said, I am no good. You know, there's nothing good within me. I might as well live out what I see myself as. How many people today are living that way? How many people today look at their lives and they say, I'm no good. I might as well act bad. God can't, you know, God can't save me. If I walked into a church, the roof would fall down. Anyone who says that to me, I say, let's put that to the test. <laughs> I'll see you Sunday morning. <laughs> Hasn't fallen down yet. But she comes into this dinner party. And of course, in those days, they didn't sit in chairs. They laid on the floor, and they had a short table, and Jesus would be leaning against the table, and his feet would be behind him. And she came in quietly, and she began to weep. Because she had heard Jesus' teachings. Because she had believed that somehow she was not simply identified as a sinner, but that she could be forgiven. And she came in and she weeped on Jesus' feet and she washed her feet with her hair, wiped it with her hair, kissed her feet, took very expensive perfume and anointed his feet. And everyone in the dinner party was sitting quietly as she was doing this, looking at her like, what do we do now? And then Jesus told a story about the one who was forgiven much would love much. Put it in context. How many people here have a mortgage? Someone comes and offers to pay your entire mortgage. What are you going to think about that person? You're going to invite them over for dinner? <laughs> yeah. Particularly if you knew them and they said, out of my generosity, I'm going to pay your mortgage. You didn't owe it to them, but they paid your debt. How much more has Jesus paid our debt of sin? 
This woman believed in Jesus. And because she believed in Jesus, the grace of God transformed her life. She no longer saw herself as simply someone who was rejected by God, someone who could never enter the kingdom. Rather, she gave herself to an extravagant worship. It took courage to go into that house. Think about it. She wasn't invited. She came in and began to weep uncontrollably and anoint Jesus' feet. Now, I don't know about you. It's okay to kiss babies' feet, <laughs> but the feet of someone who was wearing sandals in Jesus' day, covered with dust and who knows what else, you know, that is an extravagant act of worship. And Jesus turns to her and says, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. You're no longer a sinner. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, Paul says, By the grace of God, I am who I am. He was talking about, you know, uh, the other apostles, and he says, I'm the least of all the apostles because I persecuted the church. I can't believe that God even considered calling me to be an apostle to the Gentiles. But by the grace of God, I am who I am. Paul wasn't identified by his past life. He wasn't identified by his failures or by his wrong decisions. He identified himself by the grace of God. And the same thing is true with us. We don't identify ourselves by what we do. We don't identify ourselves by our, our past experiences. We're not identified as victims of a crime. We're not identified as, you know, sinners and failures in God's sight because we have been redeemed by God's grace. Every single person we know, the Bible says, has been born in sin, but we've been born again by the grace of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. And that new birth gives us a new identity rooted in God's grace. Now, I know most of us know that information. My question is, are we living it? Is that in the forefront of your mind every single day? Or do you self-select to look at yourself as a sinner? Yeah, I know God forgave me. I can't figure it out. But man, I'm just, I'm no good. I can't do anything for God. It's not true. I believe everyone's on a journey. And God's desire is that we move from being a sinner to being a child of grace. The problem is that many people get stalled on that journey. They never come to Christ. Either they love their old identity and don't want to give it up, or they can't see that there's any way to be transformed by God's grace. But we have. How has God's grace changed us? I want to look at, real quickly, three things. Well, first of all, let's define grace. Grace, usually, you know, the acronym G-R-A-C-E is God's riches at Christ's expense. We look at that and we realize Jesus paid for my sin. He died upon the cross to pay the penalty so that I could be freed from my sin. It's God's unmerited favor to each one of us. It's a free gift. You know, all gifts aren't free. <laughs> There's some gifts that if you receive them, you've got to pay. Um, but not so with the gospel. It literally is a free gift. It's God's forgiveness through what Christ has done. And so there's the grace of forgiveness. We call it saving grace. We sang that today. You know, amazing grace. What did it do? It saved me. Who was I? A wretch that I am. You know, the man who wrote that, that song, John Newton, was a, he was the owner uh, and captain of a slave ship. 
And when he came to Christ, he realized the things that he was doing were so wicked that it just broke his heart. And he says, I can't be defined by what I have done because I've been transformed by God's amazing grace. It saved me. It changed me. I have the, 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 you know, I can look forward to heaven because of what God has done. He has not counted my sin against me. He has forgiven me. Just like that woman that came into Jesus, she's, he said, your sins are forgiven. Imagine the new start that she had. Imagine having her conscience wiped clean. Having the shame eradicated from her life. Having the guilt just wiped away. All our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. We do not have to make up any excuses. We don't have to blame anybody. Will we make mistakes? Yeah. How are we going to disappoint God? Yeah. Are we defined by our failures? No. Because all of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. That's grace. And our worship means that we want to obey Jesus because of his grace in our lives. The grace of forgiveness inspires us to obey. There's the grace of enablement. Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery after he said, you know, where are your accusers? They had all left. She should have been stoned because she was caught in the act of adultery. And he says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Remember that story in John chapter 8? Go and sin no more. How can she go and sin no more? Because grace is the power that God gives within us that enables us to obey him. Without that grace, we can't obey God. We, you know, if you say, Chief, Lord, watch me this day. I am going to obey you out of my own strength. It doesn't work. At 10 o'clock, forget it. <laughs> we'll try it again tomorrow, Lord. Because he has to give us the enablement. Grace is the enabling presence of God in our lives that allows us to be able to do what we can't do by ourselves. Let's, <clears throat> let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Now, as you're turning there, in 1 Corinthians 12, there's a whole list of spiritual gifts. We all are familiar with that. The Greek word for those gifts are, are charismata. They are literally grace gifts or grace enablements. That anything that we do for God comes by grace. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How does he strengthen me? By his grace. How do we prophesy? How do we uh, see miracles and healings? It's by God's grace. It's not by us. God's grace enables us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for you to do. So does God give you a list of things to do and it's your assignment and you've got to go do that and they seem an absolutely impossible to you but you've got to find a way to do it? Or does God prepare good works for us to do ministry for us to do, and then he gives us all that we need to fulfill that. This is the second one. That's grace. Grace not only saves us by forgiving our sin, 
it also gives us his power within us in the presence of the Holy Spirit where we can do things that we cannot do by our natural selves, but we can do it when the Holy Spirit works through us. Samson was a man in the Old Testament who was extremely strong. Where did his strength come from? Holy Spirit. Yeah, well, his hair, yeah. He, <laughs> it wasn't just his hair. He disobeyed God. That's why he lost his strength. But, but he was a Nazarite, so he grew long hair. He didn't drink wine, and he was dedicated to God. But he only had supernatural strength when the Holy Spirit came upon him. Go ahead. Go read through that in Judges. It says when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he had the supernatural strength. If the Holy Spirit didn't come upon him, <laughs> he had nothing. That is the enablement of grace. That's, you know, the, the um, created for good works. If God calls us to do something, he gives us the supernatural spiritual ability to do that. Even if it means loving your enemies. I can't do that in the natural. But the Bible says that many times. We need his grace to empower us. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And Paul is saying, I embrace God's enabling grace. It's his grace that allows Christ to live his life through me. It changes our identity. And the last thing is the grace of deliverance. Grace delivers us. God's power delivers us. I want you to turn to... Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 14. And look at what <clears throat> Paul writes to Titus as he's on the island of Crete. He says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself of people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. The grace of God appeared. Jesus came in truth and grace. And it says that this grace in our lives delivers us from the old way of life. It teaches us to say no. It not just simply instructs us, it breaks the pattern of our lives. The woman who came and washed Jesus' feet with her tears, we don't know what happened to her afterwards. But I'm going to surmise that because of her act of worship, because of what God has did within her life, that she left and she lived a life that was transformed. That she was set free from the bondages and the strongholds of her life that held her trapped in a life of sin. Grace of deliverance. Jesus said to her, go in peace. You can only go in peace if you've been delivered. There are many Christians who are not living in peace because the grace of God has still to deliver them from the bondages of their lives. And God's grace can. I love that phrase in O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing where, where um, it says, He breaks the power of canceled sin. We come to Jesus, our sin is, is canceled. It's forgiven. 
the debt is wiped away. But his grace can also break the power of that sin in our lives. Oftentimes, many of us live our lives. We know we're forgiven. We know that, 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 that Jesus has forgiven our sin, but we're kind of like Gronk running for a touchdown, and there's like three guys trying to tackle him, and he's running, and these guys are on his back, right? And we go, 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 and he's carrying these guys down the field, and they, they finally tackle him. You've seen that picture, right? Patriots fans. Yeah. Oftentimes, we look at our Christian life, we're kind of like that. We feel like Gronk. It's like, oh, man, I'm trying to go forward. <laughs> and the enemy's on our back. And we go, well, I'm just suffering for Jesus. Maybe. But maybe that grace that breaks the power of canceled sin needs to be applied to your life. And so someone comes with the enabling grace and says, let's pray. If you feel that there is an enemy on your back, we can pray for God's grace that delivers us from our past sin, that wipes it out, that takes away the shame, the guilt, that takes away the bondage, that takes away the things in our mind that stop us, that bring us up short, because we identify ourselves with our sin rather than with the grace of God. And it, it can be broken. An illustration a friend of ours years ago showed us is very apropos here. Um, if you look at my hand, my hand can function perfectly fine. It's designed by God to function. You know, I can twist it. I can move my fingers. Um, it's able to move. Can you hold this for me? If the enemy comes and adds something to it, we call that dysfunction. Now my hand can't function the way it was created to function because the enemy came and added something to my life, and now I can't function. I say, I am dysfunctional. Is there anything in intrinsically wrong with my hand? No, it's what was added. If I want to be free of dysfunction, I remove what the enemy added, and now my hand is able to function again. Oftentimes in our lives, emotional dysfunctions is really the bondage of the enemy that he adds to our lives. And we are convinced it's us. And we identify with that dysfunction rather than the grace of God to set us free. We are not to be defined by our past. We are not to be defined by our struggles. We are not to be defined by our job or our own sense of importance or a lack of importance. We are not to be defined by our sickness. We are not to be defined by our circumstances, but by the grace of God that gives us everything we need for life and godliness in him but by the grace of God that forgives our sins, by the grace of God that enables me to minister in the power of the Spirit in places where I never thought I could be, by the grace of God that delivers me, that cancels the power of, broke, uh, of canceled sin, that frees me from the tormentor of my soul. Bottom line, simply this. God's Unmerited favor changes lives. It's as simple as that. Gives us a new identity, our true identity, child of God. And so I call you, do not let your sickness, past, addictions, the way you've looked at your life, the Eeyore complex. You know, Winnie the Pooh, right? Oh, it's bad. It's going to get worse. <laughs> Don't let that define you. But see yourself as a child of God, a son or a daughter of the king who has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, set free. That your sin 
does not need to have dominion over you. That you may be dealing with sickness, but you are not a sick person. You may be dealing with an addiction, but you're not an alcoholic or a drug addict. It's far better to say, I'm a child of God who is struggling to overcome the bondage of the enemy in my lives, rather than say, I'm an alcoholic, or I'm a sinner, or I'm a bad person, because there is no hope for healing. Are you with me? Grace says we are no longer victims, but we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and set us free. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us to receive this simple truth. That when we wake up tomorrow morning, Lord, that we would declare that we belong to you. That we are a child of God. That your grace has set us free. That your grace has forgiven our sins, past, present, and future. That your grace teaches us that we can be enabled to obey you. That your grace can break off the tactics of the enemy in our lives. And that we can live with a growing sense of being more than a conqueror. Being a victor in Jesus. That, that, that we can do all things that you call us to do in Christ who gives us strength. Lord, set us free from the limitations the enemy puts upon us and that we put upon ourselves. And help us, Lord, to hear what your identity of us is. Speak to us, Lord, about who you created us to be. Show us, Lord, like you did Paul, that I am who I am by your grace. And Lord, we pray that you would release us, Lord, into a kingdom understanding of our identity. That, that, that we can function as, as evangelists and pastors and prophets and apostles. That, that we can move in the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit because we realize it's not us, it's you. And Lord, that we are looking to you just like this woman who wept at your feet. Help us, Lord, with our worship to anoint your feet with perfume and walk in the freedom that you created us for. So, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me for our <clears throat> benediction? It's taken from Philippians chapter 4, verse 23. This is what Paul writes. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let me say it again. The grace, the unmerited favor of Jesus. May it be with your spirit throughout this week. In Jesus' name.